This is a talk about actinolite. And this is a mineral that's easy to collect in my part of the world. And it's easy to collect because what they colloquially call alpine mud flows, which is a type of landslide. And the fact that the town of Wrightwood, California sits on top of the San Andreas Fault. So when you come into town, this is your welcome to Wrightwood sign. Please note that you're at an elevation of about 6,000 feet. And when it says resort area is three miles, that's the ski resorts and they're important to the story. And business center one mile, um, that's downtown. And it's not much of a business center if you're used to a big city, but it's a cool little town. So tonight, I wanna to talk about actinolite. And actinolite is basically an amphibole. It's monoclinic in its crystal structure. And this is a piece of actinolite that we've got in the lab at my college. So as you can see, it is green. It has very few commercial uses. Most of those are ones you don't wanna get into. So most of the time when people collect it, it's because it's pretty. So green, usually bright green to grayish green, and all of the physical properties are there. If you'll notice the sample that you see, which is very indicative of right wood, vitreous luster, the streak is white. Hardness usually is a little closer to six than to the five. It's got really good cleavage if you get a hand lens out. And here's where it starts varying all over the place. This thing can be bladed, columnar, radiating, fibrous, asbestiform, granular, massive. And all of those are not present at right wood. What you see at right wood is mostly the bladed. Sometimes you'll get columnar. A lot of times it does show some radiating habit, but not commonly. And you usually find it in metamorphic rock. And in metamorphic rock, there's a type of rock called a schist. And actinolite is a, an index mineral for the green schist facies. So when you find actinolite, that tells you what metamorphic facies you're in for metamorphic rock. Um, the same rock, or same rocks, same mineral, close up picture. And what I'd like you to notice is if you can, the really cool quasi radiating fibrous amounts. It's just gorgeous stuff to look at. It's really pretty. So this sort of structuring that you see is very, very common. Now I'm gonna turn this over. And what I want you to notice is, do you see, this is part of the schist over here that this mineral grew in. And so we're gonna be talking a lot about that. It's Polona schist. And that's the rock that basically underlies the town of Wrightwood. And then flipping this to the other side, see how you can get beautiful long crystals. And I did not pick this piece because it was gorgeous. I picked this piece because it's reasonably typical as well as being gorgeous of what you can get up there. And I don't know if you noticed, so I'm gonna back up a little bit. Um, this piece is 13 centimeters long. You get pieces that big, no problem. All right, this is actinolite also. Um, this is about 17 centimeters long. I had to take a ruler out and measure it. And this is in my front planner, trying to keep the soaker hose in place for the roses. So it's been out and exposed some like 20, 25 years in a fairly moist environment. I'm about 15 miles from the seacoast. And I wanna show you what it looks like weathered because of course, when you're going out to look for it, you might also see it weathered. But if I were to break into this, I would see that nice vibrant green once I got away from the weathered surface. Now, actinolite is part of what's called a solid solution series. And I'm not sure what everybody's mineral background is in terms of chemistry. But basically, if you go from tremolite, which is a sister mineral, so tremolite up here has calcium, and then the other end of the series is ferroactinolite, and I'm sorry, I pointed to calcium, has magnesium. Ferroactinolite has iron. Anything in the middle where it can switch back and forth from magnesium to iron in different proportions is referred to as actinolite. The main way you tell one from another by eyeball is color. So tremolite usually goes to white, when it starts to get a real nice light green up to a bright green, they call it actinolite. 
when it starts to become a very dark green, that almost greenish black look, that's when you're going to find it as ferroactinolite. Most of the time when you find the mineral, it's just plain old green. And so if you even look in mineralogy books, a lot of times they'll call it the tremolite actinolite solid solution series. And then in the fine print, you'll find out that actinolite's really filling up the middle of the series. You know, they'll mention ferroactinolite. So almost all the time, if it's green, people just call it actinolite. And you actually pretty much need a chem lab to really see if you had ferroactinolite. Now, sometimes you can get some chromium in there, and then it turns a bright emerald green. Smaragdite is what that's called. I've never seen it, and quite frankly, I didn't even know about it until I started researching for this talk. So this is something I'm going to be looking for in the future. This is actinolite. This is tremolite, and if you'll notice, this looks a bit more fibrous, but you can see how very, very close the habits are. And this is white. This is from Switzerland. And this is the right wood actinolite. So naming. Tremolite got its name from the Tremola Valley of Switzerland. Actinolite got its name from the Greek actis, meaning ray or beam, which is those nice crystals. And here's where it gets a little interesting. If you, there is any commercial use for this mineral, it is either as asbestos, which for the most part, we don't wanna be messing with. And the pyroxene asbestos is much more what people look for in the United States when they're trying to find an asbestiform mineral to use for fire retardation. So in the US, basically actinolite or tremolite is pretty much non-commercial. But I found this picture, and this is tremolite, and you can see the nice fibers that will give you mesothelioma if you get too close to it or breathe in too much. Now, nephrite, and nephrite is when actinolite or tremolite or anything in the series has a very compact formite. That's one of the two major forms of jade. And this is from Lander, Wyoming, and this is what they call black lander jade. And What's giving it the black color instead of a green color is there's inclusions in that of graphite. Now, you saw this photo before, and I'm putting it up again because what I want to do is I want to concentrate on the Polona schist, which is the source rock for this. And here's a piece of Polona schist that was found at the same location where the actinolite was found. So first off, I'll have you notice that you can see the texture across the schist. It's got strong foliation, and that's caused by muscovite micas. And if you look at this in detail, what you'll find is quartz. You'll find a felspar, and almost always in a green schist, your felspar is going to be an albite, which is the sodium end of the felspars. And if you see these little black specks, those are either actinolite or their small horn blend. And it's everywhere. I tried to blow this up and I couldn't, this was the least blurry blow up I could get. But what I really want to show you was how nice the muscovite is in here. And then you can see the little white lines, which are mostly the felspars. The quartz crystals will show up as these little round nuggets. They kind of look like slightly gray, really tiny rice grains, but it's a really good rock for students to look at because the minerals are all different enough where it makes it pretty easy for them to ID them. Now, how you get this stuff is, basically it's what's called a green schist facies rock. So schist is a type of metamorphic rock. And on this diagram, this is temperature, and pressure at which rock metamorphose. And so the green schist, which is where the actinolite fits in, and I'm gonna stay in English units, about 575 to 850 degrees Fahrenheit, and you're at very, very shallow depths, one and a half to 18 and a half miles. The type of metamorphism is called regional, so metamorphism that happens over a very large area. And this is classic green schist when you have mafic rock and mafic low in silica, high in iron and magnesium, 
And these would be your basalts, which make up the sea floor, and the gabbro, which makes up the lower sea floor. And if this rock was to go down a subduction zone and go just part way down, you're going to end up exactly in this range of pressure and temperature. And so basically, that actinolite is most likely metamorphosed um, oceanic crust. Now, I've got a video I want to show you about going down a subduction zone. And I've had some trouble with this video. And so if it doesn't play, I've got it set up to play in a different way. And it looks like it's not going to play because I can see cannot play media. While you're watching the video, please pay attention to this area right here, okay? And I'm gonna escape from this for a minute. And hang on, let's get rid of that. Now let's go in here. In a subduction zone, the thinner yet denser oceanic plate dives beneath the continental plate. The continental plate is locked to the subducting plate by immense friction along the shallow portion of a vast sloping fault surface. GPS data for many subduction zones show that the friction indeed causes the leading edge of the overlying plate to be forced backwards. During subduction, the thin layer on top of the oceanic plate is scraped off and forms a wedge at the front of the continental plate. The continental plate deforms in response to the stress. The plates can lock for hundreds of years until frictional stress is overcome in a process called elastic rebound. This can produce magnitude 8 to magnitude 9 great earthquakes. Tsunamis occur when the ground beneath the ocean is displaced, as it does in the simplified animation. This cycle of locking and building stress, followed by catastrophic release, repeats every few hundred years. All right, now, this is a series of cross sections of the subduction zone off California. And so if you go back 100 million years, what you're going to find is that, trying to get the cursor here, you've got the exact same setup you had in the vid. Now, this would be the Sierra Nevada. And the melting that's occurring in the asthenosphere here, that's the rock that's giving you basically the Sierra Nevada batholith to be. And as the Farallon plate's going down, and the Farallon plate was in the position of where the Pacific plate is now, and eventually it's going to subduct underneath California, and California is going to be butted up against the Pacific plate instead. But as it's going down, You've got the four arc basin, and like they said, the stuff you scrape off the top, the Franciscan. You're also going to get sediment that basically washes out from these mountains out into the ocean, and it's going to become part of just the really crazy, messed up sedimentary and metamorphic rock you find there. At about 80 million years ago, what happened is the classic subduction basically got modified. And what happened is the Farallon plate started coming in at a much, much shallower angle. And this is what's called flat slab subduction. And there are some reasons for it that have to do with the plate being less dense and a little bit thicker locally. But when the flat slab subduction starts, one of the things is you're going to get that area that I asked you to watch real closely in the video where you have lots of friction. Notice it's gonna get a whole lot bigger which means you've got the possibility of creating a whole lot more metamorphic rock. And at 80 million years ago, it's still going down. And it's the basically the weight of this pulling down that pulls the rest of the plate behind it. Well, subduction quits on the West Coast. And when subduction quits on the West Coast, it's because the whole plate in this area subjected underneath North America. And so now you've got the other plate 
that was attached on the other side of the ferrolon plate, which is what we call the Pacific plate today. And the Pacific plate and the ferrolon plate were separated by a spreading ridge and the spreading ridge couldn't go down. And so you changed from having subduction on the West Coast to having faulting. And in this paper, and this is Jacobson and a whole lot of others, 2011, they were exploring what kind of faulting was occurring as you developed the San Andreas, what would be the San Andreas system of today. And notice that, and I wanted to show you this, Kelowna Schist, which is the rock that we're gonna be looking at and talking about all day, can be occurring in two different places if you've mostly got a thrust option for your faulting. If you go to an earlier strike slip model, do you see how you have a large amount of Kelowna Schist down here? Like I said, right at the base of the overriding plate. And so what's happened here is everything above has totally eroded off today. And this rock, this nice light purple is now exposed at the surface of the earth. And that's the rock that we're seeing the actinolite come from. So where are we? Okay, California over on the upper right-hand corner, San Bernardino County in the orange color. And San Bernardino County is where I'm from, so the home county. And if you look at the big map of the county, notice there's a whole lot of gray. Those are the populated areas of the county. So as you can see, an awful lot of San Bernardino County has no town, no real population. It's called the Mojave Desert. And there's mountains that come through right through here. And these would be the San Gabriel Mountains over here and the San Bernardino Mountains over here. And this little circled community is Wrightwood. Now I wanna show you a map view coming up from Los Angeles. Okay, and so here's LA. So if you come out to LA because you wanna do all the movie studios, see the beach and then come down and visit me in Orange County and do Disneyland, you would basically get to this area by driving out on the 10. You get to the 15 at Rancho Cucamonga, go up through Cajon Pass and Cajon Junction right here is where you would be turning off. If you go on the 15, that's called go to Vegas. This is what's called Pear Blossom Highway, the 138. Then you'd come back here and this is the California two. So you'd take the turn off for the two and you're gonna end up at Wrightwood. We're going to be looking at the communities of Wrightwood and Big Pines in particular. And the other thing I want you to notice on this diagram is Mount San Antonio. It's commonly called Mount Baldy. It's the tallest mountain in the San Gabriels. And so in a lot of the maps I'm going to show you, Wright Mountain and other local places won't show, but Baldy will. So that's a real good point to tag in your head. And I'd like you to notice the nice mountain front on the north side of San Gabriel's, which comes right down through Cajon Pass and goes right above San Bernardino. And if you look at that, that's the San Andreas Fault cutting through. Now, this is a geology map and it's pretty bare bones. I wanted to accentuate the faults. So here's the town of Wrightwood and here's the San Andreas Fault. And as you can see, you could not have placed a town on a worse location if you're worried about earthquakes. And then to add to the problems, this is the punch bowl fault. And if you'll notice the scale of miles down here, we're only a couple miles away. And the punch bowl fault is still an active fault. It's part of the San Andreas system. And the punch bowl fault used to be the plate boundary. San Andreas has only been the plate boundary for about the last 5 million years. And so this area in between which you can see up here, and you see the nice little stippled color, that's Polona schist. So that's your major rock type. It's a schist, it's metamorphic, it's not real strong. And this mountain range right through here is known as the Blue Ridge. Now it's not the Blue Ridge that you're used to in Virginia. My dad's from Virginia. And whenever he talks about, we talk about this mountain range, he, he laughs because he says it's not the real Blue Ridge. But this Blue Ridge gets its name because of the blue-gray color of the Polona schist. And the mountain we're really interested in is right here. This is Wright Mountain. And um, basically one of the early ranchers back in the 1880s was the Wright, or ranchers were the Wright family. 
and they gave the area the, the name of the town and the name of the mountain. And as you look at this, what I really want you to take in is just how precarious the situation is for this poor town with respect to earthquakes. Okay. Now, this is from Google Maps, and it's laid out a grid of the streets in Wrightwood. Remember, you've only got about 5,000 people. The red line through here is the San Andreas again. Here's Wright Mountain. And I'd like you to notice these beautiful scars on the mountain. And these are the landslides. So this is the Heath Canyon landslide. This is the Sheep Canyon landslide, and this is the southern branch and the upper branch. And what has happened here is this town is not only sitting on a fault, but it's perpetually having landslide problems. And so when this slides, it comes down Heath Canyon. And in the past, it's just taken out the whole south end of town. Or you'll get a slide over here on Sheep Canyon. Same thing happens, comes down and takes out the whole end of town. And um, not a very good thing to have happening to your town. So in 1941, in particular, um, the town was pretty much destroyed. Most of the western half of town down here had not been developed. But over here, and you're just seeing this on the map, were the first ski resorts put up here on the Blue Ridge. And so this area all around is nat National Forest. This is the Angeles National Forest. And so this is one of those occasions where people said, maybe we shouldn't rebuild the town. Um, that's not what happened. So earthquake history wise, the biggest earthquake on the Southern part of the San Andreas is the 1857 Fort de Home. And the epicenter was up here by Parkfield. And notice that Wrightwood is indicated on this map. And Wrightwood is indicated because you had 225 miles of surface rupture and the southern surface rupture ended in Wrightwood. And they say Wrightwood, but it actually ended at the Big Pines Ranger Station just outside of town. The Carrizo Plain, which is this area right in here, is where you saw the maximum offset on the fault. And so you had places where you had streams where the stream on this side of the fault would basically be 30 feet away from where it used to drain on the other side of the fault. So the offset on this was huge. It was a 7.9. Most of the damage was at Fort Tahome. Fort Tahome was an army post right about here at what's called the Big Bend, and it was pretty much destroyed. There was only one death in this earthquake, and that was at the little town of Gorman. And if you're in Southern California, You'll know the town of Gorman because it's on the um, Interstate 5 heading up to Sacramento. And um, it was an adobe and it just pancaked and collapsed. And there was a man inside and he died. This earthquake was felt from Marysville, which is in Northern California. That is approximately 60, 70 miles north of Sacramento, all the way down to San Diego. It was probably felt down in Mexico. But we kind of have a US-centered story on this. And so I don't know how far down into Mexico it was felt. But it was felt east as far as Las Vegas. And this is the Big Pine Ranger Station. And this is off Google Maps. And if you'll notice, um, nice old 1930s Ranger Station type Forest Service construction, except for this kind of odd tower sitting over here. And so this tower was built to support a walkway that went over the road. And it was, there was another tower on the other side. And the idea was, was then people didn't have to cross California 2 to get across the street to the ski resorts. So um, fine. But this tower also used to have a plaque on it that said, this is you know, exactly where the surface rupture from the 1957 earthquake ended. And the tower was very unstable. The sister tower across the street was torn down. And the walkway, of course, was torn down. And when they rebuilt the tower, I got a kick out of this. This happened about 10, 15 years ago. 
the plaque that talked about the earthquake was removed and instead you have a brand new plaque that talks about the county board of supervisors that's improving the landscape for you by making the tower stable. Now we're gonna go do a 90 degree twist. And so this is California too. And if you'll notice it turns and goes like this. And here's a little road that goes up on Table Mountain. Table Mountain has picnic grounds. And interestingly enough, back in the 1920s, Table Mountain also had a solar observatory that was administered by the Smithsonian. And when JPL and NASA got involved, it was handed over from the Smithsonian to JPL. And so they do the solar observatory. But Table Mountain up there also has picnic grounds and you can see all through the Mojave, beautiful view. But I want you to look straight down the road like this. And so two goes off and then County, LA County Road 4 continues straight on. And what you're doing here is you're looking straight down the San Andreas Fault. This is across the street from the ranger station. And uh, this is sad, but true. And I've got to admit, I understand why. This is the most anticipated stop on any geology field trip I take up to the mountains. This is where the restrooms are. And um, they're not flush or they're flush toilets. They're not porta potties or pit toilets. And usually by the time we've got to Wrightwood, we've made three or four stops, which means that everybody wants a potty break and everybody is also eat dying to eat lunch. And so this is a good place just because it has potties that are free. Um, Wrightwood is a tourist town and so almost any business in it, basically you have to buy something if you wanna use the toilets. So it's first stop at the ranger station and then head back into town. So we're at Big Pines now at the ranger station. This is the Blue Ridge here. This is Blue Ridge Campground actually. And then we're gonna head back into Wrightwood, but first I wanna take you on a look up to, to ins what's called Inspiration Point. And at Inspiration Point, we're gonna see basically a lot of the things that are gonna to lead to the mass wasting in the landslides. So mass wasting, downslope movement of material caused by gravity. You get fall, slide, and flow is the three types. You name it by what's moving. And in Wrightwood, you're either gonna have a rock something, a mud something, or a debris something. And almost always in Wrightwood, it's flow. And technically, most of what they call the mud flows in Wrightwood are really debris flows because you do get boulders and cobbles in them. The vast majority of the material is mud. They're very bimodal. So you get a, one end, you get really nice sized cobbles and boulders and then you get nothing in the middle. You really don't get a lot of pebbles or sand. You go straight to mud. And they call them alpine mud flows because basically PR people thought that made it sound cool because alpine is high mountains. And remember, you've got a ski resort business angle that's gonna be coming into this story. And so they wanna do everything they can to make this sound like a cutesy, you know, hi, you're going skiing in the Alps. So downslope movement of material caused by gravity. When you have a flow, the flow has surface contact with the ground as it goes down and it's going to move as a fluid, which means it's going to toss and turn and everything is going to become a tumbled up mess. This is from the May and June, 1969, Wrightwood debris flows or mud flows. And this is Heath Canyon. So this is on the west side of Wright Mountain. And the channel at this point is about nine, about eight feet wide. And you can see just how much crap is coming down that canyon. And you can imagine how, if it wasn't constrained, how it would just spread out when it got to the canyon mouth and basically wipe out the town, which is what it has done in the past. They've had severe mud flows for about 450 years in this area. And the worst ones that have been in 1941, 1967, and 1969. And that's worst ones in recent times. This is from the same publication. And this is down near the mouth of the canyon. And now the channel that you're seeing here is about 12 feet wide. You can actually see a little front on this as it's coming down. And what happens is, is when the slope fails up on the mountainside, 
It doesn't fail as one big swoop and everything comes down at once. It is a very messed up failure. The Polona schist is an incredibly ductile rock. And so as it starts to slope, as it starts down the slope, it's sagging. And so it'll go in pulses. And the pulses are related to snow melt. And as it pulses down, you continually get the problem of, hi, little mud flow today, little mud flow tomorrow. Oops, now we got a big one. And then for the next month, you may have little ones. So when you go to collect at the site, you don't go collecting in the spring because you never know what's going to be coming down the channel. You usually wait until like July, August, and then you're in really good shape. This is at the mouth of the canyon, and this is down near where Heath Creek and Sheep Creek have joined. And so this is where you're going to get most of the deposition. And this is going to be the area where you collect the actinolite. So here, the channel at this point has spread out. And you're about 50 feet wide. It's called Sheep Creek, and it's heading off. What, what does flow on down is heading off north into the Mojave Desert. So the things that are going to give you a problem if you're going to get landslides is basically your slope. How steep is it? And is it above or below the angle of repose? And the angle of repose means the angle of rest. So if your slopes are like 45 degrees or less, foremost rock, there's nothing going on there that's going to give it a gravity assist and say, hey, let's go rolling down the mountainside and cause trouble. And most of the slopes up in the Wrightwood area are more in the neighborhood of like 70 degrees. The more relief you've got, the greater the chance of getting a landslide. And relief is the elevation distance difference. And if you remember, I pointed out on the city town that you're at about 6,000 feet. When you're up at the top of Wright Mountain, you're approaching 9,000 feet. So you've got lots of relief. And the orientation with respect to the composition and the orientation with, with the composition of the rock and if the rock units have an orientation. Schist is highly foliated and the orientation is such that basically it runs parallel to the mountain ridge for the most part. Now that should help stop it, but this rock is so ductile that what happens is it just kind of sags in place and waits for its opportunity. Next thing you got to look at is water. And if your water and vegetation are a pretty good match for each other, usually the vegetation will use up the water before it can really soak into the ground and start causing problems in the rock. But we're bordering the Mojave Desert. We're in the rain shadow of the rains coming in off the Pacific. And so vegetation up here is pretty sparse compared to an eastern forest. It's really nice for a western forest, but for the, for compared to most of the world, it's pretty sparse. The temperature you've got is going to matter because you're going to get a different pattern if you get water or if you get ice. So if you look at the precipitation, if you're in water, how fast and how much at any particular time is going to determine whether it'll help trigger the landslide. If you get ice, you got a a totally different problem because ice can basically build up and store water, which means that when the snow melts, you get you just flood the rock below. And when you flood the rock below, basically you're lubricating it. And so you're saying, hey, let's go have a landslide. This would be great. Composition, usually the younger the rock, the more unstable. And for a schist, Polona schist is pretty young. Polona schist is only, most of it dates at anywhere from about 50 to about 35 million years. And so for a schist, that's a very young rock. Now, things that trigger landslides. You could have all of this not be great, but if nothing triggers the landslide, you're not going to have one. The biggest trigger is earthquakes. The town sits on the San Andreas Fault. On the other side of the mountain is the Punchbowl Fault constant earthquake activity in this area. On average, you're looking at dozens of earthquakes that are so small that humans can't feel them. But given the right circumstances, any one of them is more than adequate to trigger a landslide. Now, if you add a lot of weight at the top of the slope, that can trigger a landslide. And basically, if you add a lot of snow, that's adding a lot of weight. Water weighs a bunch. So that could help trigger a landslide. 
undercutting slope, I've crossed through this because that's really not a problem at not a problem at Wrightwood. That is a problem in many areas in many towns, but not the issue up here. And then the last one is heavy precipitation. Most of the time, Wrightwood gets a lot of rain for Southern California because it's in the mountains. Um, that doesn't mean they have bad mud flows every year, but when you get a year where you have lots of rain, lots of snow, and this year was a year for a lot of snow, that means you've got a much better chance. And the reason you have the much better chance is because you've got a better lubrication system. Now, this is an inspiration point on the Blue Ridge. I told you we're gonna take a side trip there. And this is looking over at Wright Mountain. And I think you would agree with me that the slopes are nice and steep. This was the last time I was up there pre-checking for a field trip before COVID. And you'll notice that basically the snow fields up here are nice and extensive this April, which means you've also added a lot of weight. Once that snow starts to melt, that's when you start to get into a problem area. Now we're gonna turn and instead of looking west toward Wright Mountain, I wanna look south. And this is looking south. I actually use this slide in class to show uh, V-shaped valleys, but notice just how steep these slopes are and how much relief there is. So you've got prime physical conditions. Let's go have a landslide. Now, what's happened is we've come down from Inspiration Point, we're back on Highway 2, and we're going into the town of Wrightwood. And the town of Wrightwood stops at the San Bernardino LA County line. So in the 1941 landslides, when the town was destroyed, what happened was they had to make a decision, do you or don't you build the town? And on the LA County side of things, you had three ski resorts and these were built in late 1920s through about 1938. And they wanted that town to exist because they needed the town as a commercial base because people who were coming up from LA needed somewhere to stay when they were skiing. San Bernardino side of things basically was where the town was, town proper, and the town had been destroyed. This is the only time in history that I know of, and maybe that's just my lack of knowledge, they called in the USGS. They called in what was the California Division of Mines and Geology, that's now the California Geological Survey. It's in the National Forest, so the Forest Service was involved. You had geologists from LA County and from San Bernardino County, and the Forest Service then called in the Army Corps of Engineers. So you have six government organizations that agreed that the best thing to do was not to build the town, basically claim, take the ranches, you eminent domain, make it part of the national forest and let that be done. However, you had three ski resorts and the people who are running the ski resorts basically lobbied incredibly heavy with both the San Bernardino County Board of Supervisors Supervisors and the LA County Board of Supervisors, and it was agreed that they would rebuild the town. And so that's why Wrightwood exists today on top of the San Andreas Fault, basically waiting for the big one to happen. Now, as you drive into town, this, is, this was two weeks ago, and this is Heath Canyon, and this is the landslide area up at the top of Heath Canyon. And as you can see, nothing has slid yet but you've got a lot of snow. And if you'll notice, can you see the bulge right here? So you've got a scarp face up here from the old landslide. And this is all schist. It's not real strong with a whole bunch of weight added on top of it from the snow. And when the snow melts, it's going to get nicely lubricated. And we're gonna come back to this picture, but I wanted to show you what it looks like as you go through town. Oops, I'm sorry, went the wrong way. So that picture was taken about here and we're looking at Wright Mountain, Heath Canyon. So we're gonna come down into town here and I want to pay particular attention to this place called the turnout. And if you look at the turnout down there, um, what's gonna happen is this is the prime collecting site. And so 
We're going to look there for just a minute, and then I'm going to come up here, and this is Wright Mountain Road, and come down in toward Wright Mountain. So this is the turnout. Uh, if you were to get out of your car and just take a look about 20 feet down, you see the Welcome to Wrightwood sign. Um, I wanted to show you this picture because if you ever get out to California, um, you'll, it, this is a great place to stop and collect. So you're on Highway 2, mile number 25, and this is a call box. And since it's a call box, what that means is this sign's gonna stay no matter what they do with other signs. This is Sheep Canyon, and the landslide up here has already occurred because you can see how all of this is bare while you still have snow on the surrounding slopes. And this is the channel making it down to the road that the Army Corps of Engineers did, dug to divert the landslides so that basically the town, and this is all landslide material that they've dug up in the last couple of weeks, okay? Uh, front of my car, the sign you saw was right over here. And this is looking west, and Wrightwood was one of the areas that a couple of years ago had um, a fire, almost take it out, so we can add fire danger along with earthquake and landslide danger. And they basically used Highway 2 as a fire break and saved the town. What I want you to notice is this piled up dirt. And if you walk up to this, this is one side of the levee system. That's the other side of the levee system up against the hill where you have all the burned vegetation. And they're actively clearing this out now. And this is heavy equipment in the same turnout I'm parked in. One of the reasons I love this turnout is you can take a bus in there. You could have eight vans in there on a geology field trip. No problem getting to it. Okay. Now. Here's the sign I pointed out before, which shows you where the turnout is. So my car's over in here. So basically I walked along the sides of the drainage channel and I walked about 50 feet away, 100 feet away, somewhere in there. And this is looking down into the channel and the Army Corps of Engineers has already pretty much dug this out. And this is the snow melt coming down. And I want you to notice the size of the boulders that are coming out of this channel. So this comes around and follows up here. And then if you were there, you saw all of the dirt piled up. This makes a little kink and it's going back. So that is looking upstream, which is south. If you look downstream, which is north, away from the turnout, this is what you see. And basically the town of Phelan is out here on the Mojave. And if you'll notice, the banks are very steep when they're newly dug. But as you walk away from the road, they will get gentler. And so one of the nice things about coming to this place to collect is that if you have mobility problems, you can still move and get around in there. Um, I had my knees replaced a few years ago, but prior to that, I actually taught using a wheelchair or a scooter. And I could bring a class out here in a bus and basically get my hiking poles in my walker with a seat. And if I had a couple of students, I could usually get down the slope here with a couple of people spotting me. And then you get somebody to bring the walker down. And then I could sit down there with the classes. Everybody was digging for actinolite. Um, I've had students with mobility problems. And if they're careful, you can usually get down here. And this is very odd because a lot of times it's hard to find collecting sites where people with mobility problems can still get in and out. The other thing is you're right below town and so you're out of the no trespassing area. If you look along the bottom, I did not walk down, I just took some photos. This is the sort of stuff that the Army Corps of Engineers dredges up and they just pile it up against the levees to make the levees higher or down on the sides. And so, like I said, you're looking at boulders all the way down to mud. And looking on map view north, the turnout is right here. So basically you can see the landslides here. So this is Sheep Creek and this is Heath Creek and they meet right there at the road on the two. And then this is the alluvial fan going out on the Mojave, which basically gives you an idea of just how much sediment comes down on a seasonal basis. Um, 
this is huge. And the gray color is from the blue schist of the Polona schist. And then you'll notice the tan background. This is your desert rock, which is basically um, felsic granitic type rock that has eroded to give you that. And if you'll notice, every little canyon on the back side of the San Gabes basically gives you an alluvial fan pattern in gray because all of this is Polona schist. Okay, so here's the turnout again, uh, the blue peg. Now, if for some reason you can't collect there, you look for turnouts right in this area. If you're right here where it's closest, that looks like it should be the best place to stop, but there's no real good turnouts there. And you gotta watch for areas of no trespassing and trespassing. So if you go right around the bend here, there's some good turnouts where you could basically park your car and then you could hike in and you don't have to worry about no trespassing signs. And like I said, as soon as you're on the other side of the two over here, you don't really have to worry about trespassing either. Anything done in town in the channels is a no-no um, trespassing. So Wright Mountain Road up into this subdivision and then I'm gonna try and get up here as high as I can get, as close as I can get to the landslides, okay? So this is driving up Wright Mountain Road. And again, you can see where the landslide has already happened for the spring. As you're driving through the subdivisions, this is not the most geologically stable place to be building a new house, but there's active construction going on. People are still building new homes up here. And now I'm back as far as I can get. I'm at a place called Mountain Star Court. This is your scale. Nice pickup truck. Kind of looks beaten up, but it still looks like it's running because the tires were good. And this is the levee that the Army Corps of Engineers has dug to save the town. And you can see the top of the levee on the other side. Now I came in and I tried to climb up this, but I got about this far up. And basically at that point, the slope was so steep and I'm by myself and basically my mobility is not as good as I'd like it to be. I decided I didn't wanna tumble down the hill and break an ankle. So I came back down and there is a pathway behind the homes coming over into this area. So if you, excuse me, <coughs> if you walk along that pathway and I got about, Oh, I'm gonna say 50 feet in. And here is the first really nice big piece of actinolite. And this is just float. It is lying on the ground and you just pick it up. It is the easiest collecting in the world. And if you'll notice, you have nice big pieces of Polona schist if you'd like to collect those also. And if you start looking around and looking for the green tint, you'll see that there's little bitty pieces of actinolite all through this. So it's really kind of a cool place to bring students because you know, everybody will find something. And when I first started teaching, um, my mentor teacher was a woman by the name of Judy Lohman. And that was one of her rules of geology field trips. If you can always take them somewhere they can collect something and bring it home. And um, it's a very good rule to do on field trips. Now I'm repeating the picture from before of what it looks like up Heath Canyon and the head of the Heath Canyon slide that hasn't slid yet. I haven't driven back to there. I just wanted to repeat it so that you'll see where this is coming from. So now I've driven across town and I'm going up Heath Canyon and this is an outcrop of Polona schist. And I did not walk over to it for it. The snakes are out and I wasn't gonna go through all of that, sorry. But if you'll look at this, what happens is, as you can see the beautiful gray green color telling you that this is a green schist facies rock. And most of the green in the green schist for the Polona schist is actinolite. Now, if you get back to where you basically um, get fenced off and can't go any further. So this is the levee and the mountain is way over here off the slide somewhere. But this is the channel coming down. And here are the nice no trespassing signs everywhere. So you can't really get in. What was fascinating to me was there's all these no trespassing signs. And I was up there for about six hours. 
everywhere where there was a no trespassing sign, I saw a mountain biker at one point or another going through in the no trespassing area. Um, since I have students, I try to honor that. It's best not to take students into illegal places. But you can, again, see how you've got nice gray dirt from the schist. This is Thrush Road. It's one of the main roads across. So the place I was showing you before was up Canyon and back up in here. And this is in town proper. And this is the levee system. And this is what's washing out. And this hasn't been cleaned out because there's still a whole lot of big stuff. So they bring in heavy equipment and they basically just pile it on top of the levee or shove it up against the sides. They pile it on top if they can. And this is looking south toward Wright Mountain. And then this is the view looking north. I'm parked in the middle of the road and there's a guy really impatient behind me. So I didn't get out of the car. And you can see how Heath Creek, you've got snow melt going on because it's contributing. And if you follow it down, you get back down to the road cut where all of this began. And again, here's stuff that's been piled up by the Army Corps of Engineers. And I want you to remember that if you were to go up here, what you're looking for is actinolite. And as you've seen, you can just pretty much pick it up off the ground if you're just observant and careful. And this is from a neighborhood by my college. So I went up a hill and this was taken about a month ago. So these are the San Gabriel Mountains from Orange County. This is Mount Baldy. And basically, right wood is back there. And you can't see right mountain because you've got Pine Mountain in front of it from here. But this is kind of my farewell photo. So if anybody has any questions, now's a good time. And I think I need to stop sharing my screen. Did I put you all to sleep? Nope, <laughs> we're all coming back. Okay. Any questions for Debbie? Debbie, I have a question. Um, does, so like in the spring, when I guess the danger of slides is the highest um, due to snow melt and that sort of thing, do they put like, the town on alert or is there certain things that the the area does in order to try to keep people alert and aware of the danger um no because everybody's alert and aware because if you think about it that drainage channel cutting through town means right. that <laughs> very few exceptions you have no through going streets okay. is one of the few through going now, what they will do a lot of times, and, and this actually works out quite well, by the time the snow melts, usually there's not enough snow left and the ski resorts have closed down. And so that kind of ameliorates a little bit of the potential damage. So what I was doing was I was watching the ski reports and I went up there the first Saturday after the ski resorts closed, which was two weeks ago. Because while it's all nice and frozen, you worry about earthquake, but you don't really worry about the mudslides. Um, one, <clears throat> one slide had already happened. The other one has yet to go. And depending on the weather, they'll probably have another spate of big slides either this month or in June. By July, it's usually pretty good. Um, if both landslides have gone on um, what I used to do, was take the geology club out there. And so go right at the end of June, right after grades are due. And we would go out and we would pick up all the actinolite we could because this was the best time of year because you've got the new float that's just come down the mountain. And then we used to sell it to a mineral wholesaler and then take the money and the class, the students who came would then get to buy minerals. And then that's how I bought minerals for the collection at the college because I didn't have a big enough budget. And then in August, when the semester starts again, usually back when I was club advisor, that would be the first activity in the beginning of September, like Labor Day weekend or something, is we'd go up and collect that kennelite to sell off. Students could 
take some home. When we sold it off, they had credit to buy more minerals. And then I had fall money to buy more for the collection at the college. And that's one of the reasons I've been up there so much over the years. Nice. <laughs> Geoeconomics. <laughs> okay, if you work for a community college, they're they're not they're not real wealthy. That's a good way to put it. That's creative. <laughs> well, I have a question. Uh-huh. I lost my power there and the whole power of the house went out for a second. So I had to get back on there to answer my, ask my question. Uh Debbie, you mentioned a word uh before geodynamics and when you first started out um and i've been reading a lot about the the movement of the different um continents and i've come across that term and i don't really understand it um but the more i read the more i get into more and more calculus which is uh something I've uh, <clears throat> forgotten more than I probably ever knew, uh, even though it took two years of it. Um, if, if I start read, finding some books that are on geodynamics, am I gonna get just buried in calculus or um, is, there, is there some easy ones that uh, don't cost a hundred bucks a piece or more <laughs> in order to follow uh, this rabbit hole I'm jumping down into? Okay, a couple of comments. We have a lot in common. Um, I was a geophysicist professionally, only I did gravitational and magnetic fields. And while I, I did mining and oil both, I used my calculus weekly, especially in oil. I've now been a community college instructor for 30 years. And if my life depended on my use of calculus, I would be dead meat, I do not remember. And when I started working on this, like I said, I contacted about a lot of my friends who, you know, I went to school with a bunch of men who became geophysicists. Most of them are geodynamicists. They started sending me papers. And my first reaction was, oh, my goodness, I used to be able to do this math. Mm -hmm. I got really good advice from one of them. He said, Debs, he said, look, you read the words, look at the pictures. If you can't figure it out then go up online. And one of the things he suggested I do, and I did that, and that's why I tried to incorporate that little video partly, is because there's lots of good little videos talking about all the different things that occur. And a lot of times you can get the gist of what they're talking about without actually having to solve the equations. Mm -hmm. If I were going to buy books, the way I would do it, is I would look for lab books, used lab books on Amazon or in textbooks.com because the explanations to get you through a lab are usually more step-by-step -step, and that usually makes it a little bit easier to figure out what's going on. Um, I do not know many, I don't know any off the top of my head books that it would be like intro to geodynamics that don't have math. Um, geodynamics, if anybody else isn't aware, these are people who study basically motion in the mantle, mm -hmm. trying to use mantle motion to figure out what's happening to the plates above. And so they are the people who go in and use earthquakes and image, for example, the slab and where the slabs are located. And this is a very controversial topic at the moment on the West Coast, because there are two competing models as to what set up the current day geology of the West Coast. The evidence for both models is quite good, but they don't mesh. In fact, there's going to be a Penrose conference this August on the topic. So many people say that when the Farallon plate subducted, it went flat in the area of Southern California borderlands. And then that started a whole chain of events, which eventually led to the Laramide orogeny in Wyoming. Mm -hmm. And other people have looked at the, con the continental border itself, and they find sedimentological evidence that indicates that rocks that you find up in um, British Columbia were formed in Baja. 
Mm -hmm. And so they say you had to have some kind of sliding motion going up and down the coast. But how you would incorporate that sliding motion when you've got subduction going on is basically the conjury. So a Penrose conference is when they try to convene people, the Geological Society of America does this. So they try to convene a conference and get people on both sides of the argument and put them together for like four or five days. And everybody has to talk and everybody has to give their ideas. And if they can resolve something, that's very nice. But what usually happens at a Penrose conference, and this will be exciting, is they actually hammer out what all the inconsistencies are and then try to plan a research plan that would allow them to collect data to maybe get the evidence to resolve the issue. And then at modern Penrose conferences, a lot of times it's also plan a, an attack of who can we get to fund collecting the data so we can get the answer. Mm -hmm. So that's going on in August. So geodynamically, I think a whole lot of stuff will be coming out basically over the next couple of years as they try to solve this this conundrum on the west coast i and thought i saw uh, um, a couple of three years back i don't know if it was in aipg or, or or which one of the rags that pop up on my screen that someone had some deep seismic evidence that the farallon plate was stacked up underneath the uh, no. Uh, north the northwest coast seattle and and uh, so the, the plates were literally broken into multiple fragments and stacked up well yeah. they, it's called uh from what i've heard uh nick zentner had a, a whole series on the baja bc problem and had people from all different sides uh stating their case and uh called uh um they call it ribbon candy because it looks like the old fashioned <laughs> old-fashioned ribbon candy that goes like this and they use tomography to find that out but the the three or three books i've been looking at uh textbook of geomorphology and geodynamics um i don't know the author of that one geodynamics by don donald turcoat which is an older book uh but since oh, 2020 or since 2000 i should say and then archean geodynamics and environment and uh, those are the three I've been mainly sort of honing in on to see where I could find what I wanted to know. Um, I can ask some people, Cindy, and if anybody gives a good book, I, or excuse me, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. Beth. I can ask some people, Beth, and if anybody um, has some good ideas, I can email Cindy with some references. Okay. I would really appreciate it because uh, this is getting very, very interesting, but uh, uh, I do like you were, were talking about. I look at the pictures, I read the words. As soon as I get to a few paragraphs of math, I jump over that and then go on to the rest of it. Yep. And I it's kind of- I don't want to tackle the calculus at my age. <laughs> I, I understand completely. In fact, my first response to one of the first papers I came in was, do you realize this thing is full of tensor calculus? And the response I got was, yeah, you know how to do that. And I'm like 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Well, mine was even more than that. Let's see, it would be about 50 years ago. <laughs> okay. Thank you, appreciate it. Any other questions for Debbie? I have, I have a question. Uh, Debbie, how effective uh, are the, are those channels built by the Corps of Engineers? Does it actually do the job and 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 continue to do the job as they're washed away and rebuilt every year? And also, um, did you comment at all on how fast those mud and debris flows move? The channels are incredibly effective because they they were they're basically rubble piles built, and it's not like with a river system like like the Mississippi, where you have constant flow, you only have flow for a few weeks a year. And so, and the flow that comes down varies um, when they're flowing. I, I'm sorry, but I'm forgetting exactly how fast, but I remember thinking, oh, that's not that bad. But most of the time it's sludgy going down. A large part of the mechanism is creep. And when it gets down on the flat, it slows down even more. And so, yes, you can have big surge things that occur, but 
but it's not consistent. So most of the time it's just kind of creeping sludge. Like running from a lava flow, you can outrun it. <laughs> yeah, um, actually one of the funny things is a lot of the engineering types who work up there, um, they have a name for it. They actually call it slide creep because <laughs> They think of it basically as like a concrete mix sludging down the channel. Mm -hmm. But the channels have, they were built in the early 40s and they're still working today. You just have to maintain wow. them. That's impressive. It's probably the best kludge I've ever seen for trying to solve a problem <laughs> without putting any permanent structure in. Debbie, I have a question for you about what your students are finding in their searches. Do they ever come across this rare form of actinolite, which is asbestos, you know, actinolite asbestos? Nope. Okay. The, the green stuff that I showed you, that's, that's what you find. Okay, thank um, you. If you look for the asbestos, or if you're looking into that, um, it turns out that a lot of that is in Australia which kind of surprised me because I got to looking, okay, where would I go? And it turns out that Australia is the place where they've mined most of that and they actually had commercial mining. Most of the actinolite or trem, and usually it's tremolite more than it is actinolite on the asbestos, but um, most of it is not around in commercial amounts the way that the pyroxene based ones out of like the chrysotile out of serpentine and stuff like that. I guess that works better and it's much more deadly and it's easier to find. Thank you. Debbie, I have a question for you. You said that you, uh, you sell the actinolite um, to raise money to, for the students to buy other minerals. How much do you get for a piece of actinolite? Okay, this is what we used to do. Um, there used to be a mineral wholesaler called Berminko. I don't know if any of you are familiar with them. The Burnham Mineral Company in Monrovia, California. And my first hardness kit that I bought at UCR in the bookstore was a Berminko hardness kit. And about 15 years ago, they started winding down and about 10 years ago, they closed. So we don't do this anymore. But we could go out and basically fill a pickup truck bed with actinolite if we went out for a whole day, take it over to Monrovia the next day. And generally we would get somewhere in the neighborhood of five or $600. Okay. And so if we went in school vans, then the school got 50%. But if they drove themselves to meet me up there, then the school only got 25%. And then I had a budget and then whoever helped dig it out, they divided it equally. And they, the Bob at Berminko's, would, even though it's a wholesaler, he'd let them go through. And it would look like the school account had all this really weird stuff on it. And it was all the students, <laughs> me being the interim person to buy it, then I could sell it to the students, if you understand me, because it's a wholesaling thing. And for years, we did that from about 95 up to about 2008. And yeah, it was, we've got a really good mineral collection because of that. <laughs> Fantastic. Anybody else for Debbie? All right, well, thank you very much, Debbie. I really enjoyed your presentation. Yes, thank you, Debbie. What a nice presentation.